In this second video about nonlinear regression, we will see how we can compare nonlinear regression models. In this video, we will compare two enzyme kinetic models by using the F test and the ASC value. At the end of this video, we will have a look at parameter correlations. We will here have a look at how to estimate parameters involved in enzyme kinetics. The parameter V max is the maximum speed of the reaction which is the maximum speed the enzymes can convert substrates to products. And Km is the Michaelian's maintenance constant, which defines the substrate concentration that results in half maximum speed of the reaction. To estimate the two parameters, Vmax and Km, one has measured the reaction speed at different concentrations of the substrate. If you plot the data, we see that a higher substrate concentration results in a faster velocity. Remember that when we use nonlinear regression, we need to come up with initial guesses of the parameters. If you imagine a curve like this, we can predict that it approaches a maximum value. That maximum value is a good initial guess for the parameter V max. The substrate concentration that results in half this maximum speed is a good initial guess of Km. If you use the following code in R, which we discussed in the previous video, with the following initial guesses, the two parameters will be estimated to these values. Then we can place the fitted curve in the plot based on this function with the estimated parameter values. We'll now have a look at how to compare two different models. Suppose that we now have the following data. We fit this model to the data and get the following estimated values of the parameters Vmax and Km. If we then fit the curve, which has a hyperbolic shape, we see that the curve does not fit well with the data. If you imagine a curve that goes through the data points, we see that the curve appears to have a sigmoidal shape, which is the typical shape obtained from an allosteric enzyme. In comparison to simple enzymes, which have only one binding site for the substrate, allosteric enzymes may have several binding sites, where the binding site of one substrate may, for example, increase the activity of another binding site, which results in the sigmoidal shape, because at a certain substrate concentration, there is an instant increase in the velocity of the reaction. To model an allosteric enzyme, we can use the following equation, which has a third parameter, H, the so-called Hill coefficient. Note that if the Hill coefficient is equal to 1, this equation will be identical to this equation. If we fit the model for allosteric enzymes to the data, we will get these estimated parameter values. If we then place the fitted curve, the red curve in the plot, we see that it fits a lot better than the curve based on the simple michaelis benton kinetics. The sum of the squared residuals that we discussed in the previous video is also a lot smaller compared to the simple model. Although the allosteric model fits a lot better than the simple michaelis benton model, the question is if it fits significantly better. Models with more parameters will generally fit better to the data. The allosteric model has one additional parameter, the Hill coefficient, which means that it will always fit better because it is more flexible than the michaelis benton model. For example, if h is equal to 1, the function can produce a hyperbolic curve, whereas if h is greater than 1, the function can produce a sigmoidal curve. In this video, we will compare two models by either using an F-test or the IIC value. We will begin with the F-test. To compute an F-test, we will use a similar table as the one we used in ANOVA. The null model should represent the simpler model out of the two models, which is the model with the fewest parameters, whereas the alternative model is the model with more parameters. If two models have the same number of parameters, 
We can compare them by studying the sum of the squared residuals and select the mole which has the lowest sum of squared residuals. We begin to enter the degrees of freedom, which is the number of data points we have minus the number of estimated parameters. Since we have 9 observations, the degrees of freedom is equal to 7 because we estimate two parameters in a null model. The degrees of freedom of the alternative model is equal to 6 because this model has one additional parameter. We then plug in the sum of the squared residuals of each model. Next we calculate the difference in degrees of freedom between the two models and then the difference in sum of squares. We then calculate the F ratio with the following formula, where we plug in the differences and the degrees of freedom and the sum of squares of the alternative model. By using a statistical software tool, we can compute the p-value. The p-value corresponds to the area to the right-hand side of 170.4 in an F distribution with 1 and 6 degrees of freedom. We can compute the same table by using the function ANOVA in R. Since the p-value is less than the general significance level of 0 0.05, we reject the null model in favor of the alternative model and conclude that the model with an allosteric effect fits significantly better than the simple michelin mantel model. Note that the f-test should only be used to compare two models that are nested which means that the alternative model is an extension of the null model, like in this case, where we just add the Hill coefficient to the simple model. The archaic information criterion, or the AC, is another method to compare models. This method can be used to compare both nested and non-nested models. If we assume that the residuals are normally distributed, the AC can be calculated like this where n is the sample size, and this is the sum of the squared residuals. k is the number of estimated parameters in the model, plus 1. We will select the model which has the lowest AAC value. A model with more parameters will have a lower sum of squared residuals, because it generally fits better to the data, which means that this term will usually be smaller for a model with more parameters compared to the simpler model with fewer parameters. However, since k is the number of parameters plus 1, a model with more parameters will get the penalty because more parameters will result in a higher AC value. The model that we select should therefore have as few parameters as possible, but still fit well with the data that results in a low sum of squared residuals. If you plug in the sum of the squared residuals, the sample size, and the number of estimated parameters of each model plus 1, and do the math, we see that the ASC value of the allosteric model is much lower than that of the simple michelis mantel model, which means that the allosteric model is most likely given the data. We can compute the ASC value of the two models in R like this. The AAC values in R are calculated by the following general formula, which also can be used if we estimate the parameters with the maximum likelihood method. This is the log likelihood of the model. I explain how the likelihood is calculated in the video about ordinary least squares versus the maximum likelihood estimator. The AACs are then calculated like this, which correspond to the output in R. Note that it is the difference between the two AAC values that matters when we compare the models. We see that both methods in this case result in the exact same difference between the AAC values. Finally, we have a look at confidence intervals and the correlation matrix of the estimated parameters. If we fit the allosteric model to the data, we'll get the following estimated parameter values. For example, we are 95% certain that the true value of Vmax is between 43.8 and 47.1. Before we report the estimated parameters, 
we should study the correlations between them. Remember that the correlation coefficient can span between negative 1 and positive 1. One can think of this correlation coefficient as if you fix the value of Vmax to a certain value and then fit them all to the data, then the Hill coefficient will compensate for this change to reduce the sum of the square errors. The negative value tells us that if you increase the value of the fixed parameter Vmax, then the value of the Hill coefficient will be reduced to compensate for such change. A too strong correlation between two parameters indicates that there is a problem. If a correlation coefficient is greater than 0.9 or lower than negative 0.9, then there might be a problem in estimating the parameters of the model. In this case, none of the correlation coefficients are greater than 0.9 or lower than negative 0.9. We'll now have a look at an example where there is a too strong correlation between two parameters. Suppose that we like to estimate the growth rate of cancer cells over time. The growth of the population depends on how fast the cells divide and how fast they die. Suppose that we have the following data on the number of tumor cells over time. We fit the following exponential growth model to the data, where we fix the value y0 to 1, which means that we will only estimate the growth rate. The growth rate will then be estimated to about 0 0.0693. The doubling time of the cell population is then estimated to about 10 hours which makes sense since the number of cells doubles every 10th hour. However, suppose that we like to fit the following model to the same data, where we split the growth rate into two parameters, where P is how fast the cells divide, and D is the death rate. The correlation coefficient between P and D will then be equal to 1, which means that there is a problem in estimating the parameters. For example, if you set p to 1, d can take the value of 0 0.9307 because the difference between the two parameters would then be equal to 0 0.0693, which will result in the exact same fitted curve. Similarly, if you set p to 0, d can be set to negative 0 0.0693, which also results in the difference that is equal to 0 0.0693. We can actually set p to any value, and the nonlinear regression will adjust the value of d so that we get the same good fit every time. When this happens, we say that the two parameters are completely linked. This is due to that we try to fit a model to data that does not include any information of how fast the cells divide or how fast they die. To fit this model to the data, we can, for example, estimate how fast the cells divide in a separate experiment. Suppose that we estimated the cell division rate to 0 0.0703. Then we can fit this model to the data, where the death rate will be estimated, as well as the growth rate. This was the end of this second video about nonlinear regression. In the next video, we have a look at how we can fit a dose-response curve to some data.